Welcome TechFest. Thank you for being here today. I am joined, I'm Amanda Oborn from EcoTrust, and I'm joined by top chef and hometown hero, Gregory Gorday. Morning. Red Bay Coffee founder and CEO, Keba Conte. Oakland in the house. <laughs> and the esteemed Michael Roberts from 11th Hour Project in Palo Alto. You can find all of us in the Twitterverse at the handles above if you are so inclined. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank totally you for appreciate having it. Us. While we're talking this morning, you're going to see some photos on the screen behind us of EcoTrust project in the Central East Side Industrial District called the Red on Salmon Street, R E D D. The Red is a two city block campus entirely dedicated to food system innovation. And if you're interested in making a tour of the Red or a longer conversation with our guests here, part of your TechFest Northwest, Northwest itinerary, you will have that opportunity tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. So if you would like to wrap up PitchFest here at the Viking Center and then pop over to Southeast 7th and Salmon, we'll get you on a tour of the Red and have a longer, more luxurious conversation with our esteemed panelists. Okay, the point of this panel today is to talk about building the food system that we really want, or at least one that we can stomach. As opposed to sitting back and letting sort of the invisible hand of capitalism and tech entrepreneurship and VC and so on and so forth sort of carry us into a world created by Cambridge Analytica, if you know what I mean. We already have huge problems in our food system in terms of health and hunger, climate change and environmental degradation. <clears throat> so blindly adding all kinds of tech in terms of machine learning and robotics and AI could do nothing more than hurtle us toward the edge of the petri dish, so to speak. But food can also be connective, restorative, joyful and bonding. And so our conversation here today is really about proactively building a food system that is equitable, that's restorative, that's prosperous and delicious. So we're going to start with delicious, right? That seems like a good place to start. <laughs> so chef, flavor is not something that our food system actually optimizes for. Not at all. <laughs> so can you talk to us a little bit about the way you cook, the way you source ingredients, how you do what you do reconnects people to flavor and to taste. Absolutely. I mean, I think we all know that a lot of food is not grown for flavor. It's actually grown for shelf life and it's grown to be, you know, shipped across the state, across the country, across the world. Um, as you know, we try to get these resources to, to different groups of people. Uh, you know, obviously in Oregon, we have a plethora of farms and the, the sense of sustainability and locality is extremely important. So eating local, eating things in season, you know, these are kind of common things. Uh, but, you know, I was just visiting my family in Atlanta and, you know, there were tomatoes on the dinner table and, and you know, who knows where those tomatoes <laughs> came from. So there's still a lot of um, awareness that needs to be brought about like eating in season and people knowing what's in season and being able to source as locally as possible. Uh, you know, we've gone as far as to try to start our own kind of hydroponic garden. We have a rooftop garden at the hotel um, that we share with urban farmers. So um, urban farming, you know, that's something that's extremely important. You know, you know where it's coming from. You know what you're growing. Um, and we're seeing lots of smaller urban farms pop up around town, around the country, because people are actually more in tune with what's going on and trying to be more resourceful with uh, the land that we have. You know, so cook in season, try to buy as locally as possible. Um, and it takes a little bit of understanding, a little bit of research to know what's in season and what's truly local. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Keba, you have done such a beautiful thing in Oakland. Will you tell us a little bit about beautiful coffee for the people? So beautiful coffee to the people is our um, tagline. And it really is uh, resonates um, that Oakland spirit. Uh, the Black Panthers would say all power to the people. <clears throat> so really what we're trying to do is bring specialty coffee to, um, to be more accessible to the world. Um, but really how we define beautiful coffee is, um, is not just, you know, the beautiful people who are harvesting these uh, red cherries on volcano, you know, side at mountains in Guatemala or 
or in, in Ethiopia, you know, uh, with shade grown trees, you know, coffee farms, small family holdings, um, the process of, of roasting the coffee and making beautiful latte art. I mean, the whole process is very aesthetically beautiful. We find beauty in the relationships, um, the relationships within our own team at this side of the supply chain, the relationships that we have with our farmers uh, at Origin Country, um, and really what we're trying to do with beautiful coffee to the people is really bring, forge forward a fourth wave of coffee, if you will, and, and really bring more inclusion, diversity, um, and equity along the whole supply chain. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I mean by beautiful coffee to the people. Yeah, I, lo I love the notion of organizing around beauty yeah. in its own right. Leads to these gorgeous things. Thank you. Michael, I know that you're a deep systems thinker and we love wonking out together whenever possible on food system issues. I'm really curious how you think about the ecology of place and the kinds of food production that our land and systems and people can really support. So what do you think the fundamental issues or first principles are that investors, entrepreneurs should be focused on? Sure, thank you. Um, so at the 11th Hour Project, the Food and Agriculture Program, we, we're the uh, environmental grant making arm of the Schmidt Family Foundation. And we really found it out of an understanding and a value that agriculture can be a solution to the ecological degradation and climate change issues that we're facing today. But in order to do that, we fundamentally have to embrace complexity. There are producers all around the country and all around the world that are practicing in line with ecosystems. They're emulating how the natural world achieves its uh, ideal state. Those are not the farmers and producers that are being currently funded by massive amounts of private equity and venture capital because there's not an easy story to tell. But I will offer to a venture capitalist or a private equity funder, if somebody is telling you that they have a single solution to the problems, they either haven't done their research or they're trying to sell you something. And the reality is, is we need to put far more energy into understanding how the systems work, both in terms of natural systems. We only know a fraction of how the microbial community works underneath the soil. Uh, and we, we really have to be able to use the you know, exciting opportunities of machine learning and artificial intelligence, renewable energies, toward embracing that complexity and working in line with the agro ecosystem rather than circumventing it. Yeah, that's awesome, mm. thank you. All right, we're gonna jump into a few hot topics. I'm gonna introduce a few and let these guys jump in as they choose. And then we'll open it up to some questions. So if you have a topic you wanna throw at these guys, be thinking about that and we'll get to there in just a second. So first off is to continue this theme about investment. Ag investments are notoriously risky between weather and climate and consumer whim. Um, these can be really high risk investments. So I'm curious how you guys think about uh, if you were gonna consult with private equity, venture capitalists, other kinds of impact investors and, and help them point the fire hose of investment capital in a direction that was gonna build the food system we really want, where would you tell them to start? Sure. Well, um, you know, I, mean, I think there's a lot of really great opportunities uh, for investment from VCs to implement in agriculture, especially. So I'll give you one story. Um, in Angola, in the 1960s and 70s, Angola was one of the world's top coffee producers. And, um, and then they were, you know, then they suffered through a civil war. Uh, then they discovered oil and the booming oil industry took people out of the, um, off, off the coffee farms. Um, and now that coffee, uh, that oil, his prices is, is dropping. They're trying to revitalize their coffee farms. Uh, there are uh, some of the legacy of the uh, war though, there's landmines. Wow. So I think there's a really great opportunity to, to, to develop um, and, and, and help these farms leapfrog with technology mm -hmm. over some of the big coffee powerhouses 
the Kenyas, the Ugandas, the Ethiopias of, of the continent. And I think that, you know, if some of the technologies that, that I've seen out there um, are where, you know, folks can really tap into the agriculture and the sensors that are, you know, sort of off the grid sensors and, and some of that, that technology that could help identify the microclimates within a given farm or a region. Um, you know, these things that, that is specialty coffee, we prize microclimates and, and we're able to uh, really maximize coffee's flavor um, and the opportunity and that has a direct correlation. And if we can coordinate with say some of the movements that are clearing landmines and really make that land productive uh, right away, um, I think that would be what, what I would suggest. Yeah, that seems like yeah. an amazing use of precision ag and yeah. sensor technology and alternative energy and a million different things. So it's yeah. win, win, win for social equity too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And if I could zoom out yeah. and offer a little bit of framing to that, I think that there's this fundamental question for potential investors that Keba brings up, which is understanding the history and context of place that you're trying to work in. Yeah. This is not a one size fits all solution. Going back to my previous comment, if there's a simple solution being sold to you, it's been poorly researched or it, 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 it's, it's mis, misstating Snake the case. Snake oil, yeah. Um, <laughs> take for example, the, the United States agricultural system you actually have to consider the, the, the history of policy, the history of land disinvestment, and the, and the history of selecting winners in the industry. Corn and soy and factory farmed beef are not cheap because they're a better, more efficient system. They are cheaper because fundamentally the policies that have been in place for a generation and a half have made it that way. By making it cheaper, by underwriting the risks of production, by creating protections for large-scale industrial farmers at the expense of the small-scale farmer infrastructure. So, so as Keba mentions, this is a, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to leapfrog, but it's only, only if we do it responsibly and in place and understand those contexts. And, and I think there's some really exciting stuff uh, going on, research in terms of uh, off-grid cold storage, supply chain optimization, but, but you have to understand that the tech intervention is a tool. You have to understand that it's a tool for an outcome. So for instance, Good Eggs is, a, is an example of a Bay Area startup that thought that they were a tech company. They thought that the intervention was the user customer interface. And then they realized, oh shit, we have to acknowledge that we're a logistics company right. and a food delivery company. And just because you're really good at coding doesn't mean that you can understand the, the Byzantine nature <laughs> of wholesale markets and food logistics. Yeah, so true. I mean, I, I definitely think education is something that we need to invest in. And, and you know, I think uh, aquaponics, aeroponics, I think that has a good place in our future. You know, we've been able to see, you know, I've, I've gone to a lot of tech conferences and worked with some farms that ha are actually growing things hydroponically. And, you know, you take those elements out that are so risky with farming and, and with growing things. You take the, the, the environment out. It's a very controlled environment. It's very minimal resources in terms of light, in terms of water. Um, I think empowering people to have the education to be able to grow any food themselves, I think that's really important. I think from urban farming to maybe like we have huge scale kind of hydroponic farms and, you know, underrepresented communities, yeah. you know, with food deserts. And we teach people yeah. how to grow their own food. We yeah. teach them about what it takes to produce this food. And we're offering a system that is really low on resources, you know, like minimal water, minimal space, you know, um, and I think that would be a good start. I like the way that connects people to agriculture right in the cities where they, where most of us live Absolutely. too, which is awesome. All right, next topic. Regenerative agriculture has come up a couple times already. Rose Macario, the CEO of Patagonia, is going to be on the stage tomorrow talking primarily, I think, about their new regenerative organic certification that they've partnered with Dr. Bronner's and some other major consumer brands to launch. So I would like to know if you guys were a little bird tweeting in Rose's ear about that initiative, what would you want to tell her? <laughs> and Michael's like, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's ready. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, um, what I've read about the regenerative, you know, organic standards and practices, uh, I mean, they are still being 
generated. Um, and what I understand is they're l bringing the bar even higher, right? Let's raise the bar higher. You know, um, beyond organic. Beyond say. organic. Um, but whether it's organic or ROC, I think it's important to um, create some sort of pipeline, create some sort of uh, opportunities, some development funds where we can get more farmers, more producers, more manufacturers in the entire supply chain involved in that. Yeah. Uh, because just like organic certification, it's very easy to work with the current pool of certified organic companies and organizations and farmers. But I think if we're gonna have um, a substantive change, it's got to be, we're, we're opening, opening the circle, we're broadening the people who are participating um, to, to, to really make a difference. Yeah, awesome. And yep. I think to that point, it, it, you know, it's interesting to note organic is still two to three percent of the marketplace right now. So if we're trying to build a system uh, toward improvement, basing it on such a small niche without understanding how we're going to move the industry and the system forward is a little bit, uh, it's challenging to, to, to me when I, when I take the long view. Um, and I've always held Patagonia as a, as a paragon of, of how a company and a brand can be synonymous with its values and, and operate with integrity. And in that case, I, I absolutely understand what they're trying to do. There's a lot of conversation around regenerative right now, and there is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something of a gold rush to, to be able to market it. So I can understand why Patagonia wants to get with Rodale Institute, which is, is, is really fundamentally the birthplace of organic agriculture in the United States. Um, you know, Dr. Bronner is a supply, uh, you know, a, a, another sup a partner that understands supply chains. Um, and so I understand it in that sense, but at the 11th Hour Project, we actually spawned the Regenerative Agriculture Foundation that defines regeneration a little bit differently. We define regeneration as any system that improves the ecological, economic, and social communities on which that system depends. And so to us, regeneration is a task at hand, not necessarily a brand to be marketed. And I think that that's not necessarily at odds with each other, to Keba's point, as long as we're actually looking at how, how is this regenerative organic certification influencing university research extension? How are we ensuring that there are actually support services going to producers? I, I know in particular in their wool supply chain, there are a lot of really innovative graziers that are working on, they're grazing pub public lands or they're grazing uh, large scale crop stubble. And so there's no way that they'll actually be able to meet the regenerative organic certification, but fundamentally what they are doing is regenerative and it would be a shame for producers like that to lose uh, a, supply, uh, uh, a buyer like Patagonia simply because they don't meet the definition of this, the strictures of the standard. Yeah. Yeah, Michael, I'd, I'd like, if I may Please. jump in again, um, I, I, I like how broad, you, it's not just, you know, the organic certification, which is just purely agricultural um, um, count there, but it's taking in society, it's taking in the social component of it, it's taking in the, the cooperative economics, and that's really what we've been pushing at Red Bay, is, you know, like I said, uh, the inclusion and diversity into the special, it's into the coffee industry, which is a $50 billion a year industry. Um, and, you know, we've been really um, on the forefront of that and we're seeing a movement take off um, across this country in specialty coffee in particular. There's a conference um, here in Portland on the 24th called Black Coffee, exploring race in the specialty coffee. Um, in San Diego, there's a group of Sifter Who's, who's putting in some great work. They're also addressing these issues. And, and what I'm noticing and what I like that Patagonia does is, is they really put their action, you know, b behind their politics. Yeah. Uh, and, the, you know, and, and that's, what, that's what we've been doing and we see it paying off. We see, you know, some of these other specialty coffee companies, you know, at least putting us some brown faces on the barista line 
you know, um, I would like to see more in their C-suite, their leaders, their managers, the directors, um, and having a greater impact. Um, but uh, it starts somewhere. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. That's actually a great segue into the next hot topic, which is equity. I go to a ton of food system conferences. They are mostly white faces. Um, and so it's great to have a, a, a panel that looks like y'all here today. Um, I'm curious what you think about equity. That's, that was a great introduction. Do you guys have thoughts about your obviously a chef up here in the whitest city in America, <laughs> so to speak, and have been here for a long time? Have you had experiences that have advanced your thinking about equity in food system? Um, I mean, I mean, I think the story is multifold. You know, obviously, from my perspective, being African American is one, and also just being very in tune with where we're sourcing food is two. And just having lived in Portland, Oregon, for the past ten years, like both of those stories are, are very specific and, and yeah. a part of my everyday. Yeah. Uh, because food is such a big part of what we do, you know. And you know, there's one part where there's lush green farms, you know, all around town. But you know, the other side of the story is that we we definitely have some very specific food deserts in town, and we definitely have some communities, you know, a, a, a few projects, a few neighborhoods, a few schools um, that are definitely, like, underserved, you know, so it's like get, being able to get involved um, and bridge those gaps, you know, I think luckily we work somewhere like Oregon where we, we do have awareness around these these events, uh, these things, you know, we work with urban gleaners a lot, um, and, and they collect food from all around the city from from different grocery stores and farms and they redistribute it to different pockets, projects, neighborhoods that need more resources. Um, we work with them. Um, that's one element of it. Um, but I think, you know, just getting out there and, and, and finding something that speaks to you is, is extremely important to me, um, extremely important to a lot of people. Um, and that's at any level, you know, from community gardens in urban areas, um, from, from micro farms coming up in different parts of the, the, the state. Um, and, and, and all the work that uh, Senator Blumenauer is trying to do for us in terms of just pushing, you know, for the smaller organic farm. Yeah, Congressman Blumenauer has been a huge champion, and it sounds like you're going to do some work directly with yeah, him. Yeah, I, I actually just got back from another conference in Atlanta with the Beard Foundation where we were kind of trained on food policy um, and kind of working toward preparing ourselves to get involved. And uh, Congressman Blumenauer, uh, he has a 100% score on food policy, so... You guys should write him <laughs> and talk to him and see what help he needs so we can get some other states in this country um, to kind of see things the way we do. Yeah, awesome. Anything else to add on the equity topic before we go to the crowd here? Well, just, I mean, this without getting into the history of the United States agricultural <laughs> system and why yeah. that's fundamentally important <laughs> to, to understand where we came from in that history of exploitation, I'll leave that aside. Um, but for the sake of thinking about ecosystems, uh, businesses, policy development, in every single case, diversity outperforms homogeneity. And we, we avoid pursuing equity and diversity at our own peril. Yeah, yeah for sure. Any questions out there? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Rowena and I'm with Feeding America. One in six kids in this country don't know where their next meal is coming from, yet 40% of food in the U.S. goes to waste. And I'd love to hear from you on how we can take the passion and the intellect and the imagination of tech to help solve these problems. Well, I'll offer that there is a, a collaboration working on that, and it's a you know nonprofit, it's a it, NGOs, academics, and and and. Um, and philanthropy called Refed that's exploring you know, cutting edge solutions. It's, it's, it's a piece of the puzzle that, that we at the 11th Hour Project are not specifically working on um, beyond waste, uh, waste diversion through composting and community composting because that's, that's a solution. But that is absolutely a, a fundamental problem in our, in our US food system. And I think that there's a lot of layers. Uh, you know, food is, is very cheap. It's considered disposable, yet for so many people, healthy food is out of reach. And, and I think that the most interesting tech, tech solutions I've seen to that are the ones that are connecting the surplus to the deficit. And I think that that's, that just come, kind of comes back to the central, like, 
we don't need to reinvent the fundamental makeup of food to move us into the future. We need to fundamentally change the way that food moves and that way, the way that that food is made accessible. And I think that technology, um, you know, social media, communications, you know, all of those tools can be used to, to connect uh, the, the sources of surplus with the communities that are, that are operating in deficit. Awesome, thank you for the question. And I would argue, you said you're not working on, on food waste specifically, but I feel like everything you're doing in regenerative agriculture is fundamentally working on food waste and equity and, and getting, getting food access to people. All right. I think, yes. I think, Please. I mean, I think fix awareness again, you know, like how much, like at, at the restaurant, at the hotel, we have a huge footprint, you know, like we serve hundreds of thousands of people, yeah. you know, so is our composting efforts enough? You know, is our gardening efforts enough? I don't know. You know, we use so much plastic, you know, and we don't have a solution for some of the food storage policies that are in place by the government or the yeah, state yeah, yeah. for safety, you know? So is that enough? I, I, I don't know. I, I personally don't think it's enough, you know? Like, do, is everyone recycling? You know, are, are, are you going out to dinner and, and are you really enjoying that meal or are you walking away from the table and leaving food on your plate, you know, and you're leaving your money, you're leaving your food, you're leaving the efforts that the kitchen made. Um, and, the farmer, and, and, the and the ev farmer, and the animal, you know, and everyone I mean, all the like way up. Whenever yeah. I'm at work and I, I, I look in the garbage, in the compost bin, you know, I, I ask my cooks, like, why is this in the compost? You know, composting is a good alternative, yeah. but if we can't find a way to use that product, you know, we're actually tr producing more waste, you know, and, and the energy it takes to recycle. And I think we need to look at that in our home lives as well. Are, are we recycling everything we can? Are we, you know, using all the scraps that we have in the fridge? Are we using those carrot tops and those peels and um, using, being resourceful yeah. with the, the ingredients that we have at home as well? Um, yeah. And teaching that to our family members and to our children um, and having that truly start at home. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. And, and just uh, I want to respond to something that Gregory spoke to earlier, which is that I think that growing your own food can be one of the most radical acts of change that you can, can make and, and teaching a community. And, and it's not just teaching the community. A lot of times the knowledge is actually in the communities. I mean, in West Oakland in particular, I think there's a lot of hubris when young white advocates come and teach gardening to, to families that have, have, have had a, you know, agricultural knowledge in their family for generations. But, but really, in a lot of cases, it's a, uh, fighting for access to space for space access to space to, to grow that food um, it just I think that's a you know that that kind of falls away from the technology conversation but I think it needs to be underlined that this is really an issue of, of how we structure our communities and relationships I once had a community gardener leader say we eat our leafy greens we just call them collards right, <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, well, we are out of time. Oh we God. have Impossible Foods taking the stage next, and I know this crew has lots of opinions about plant-based diets and um, technology like Impossible Foods. So if you want to talk with this group about that, join us tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock over at the Red after we wrap up here, and we'll see you then. Thanks for being here. Thank okay. you, gentlemen. Thank you.